today's scripture is from James 1, 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet the trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Word of the Lord. Thank you. Sandy, if I started taking piano lessons today, <laughs> when would I be able to play that song? Like, never? Oh my gosh, I can't. I, I, they don't, no, they just wouldn't work. Thank you so much, that was so beautiful. Yes. If you were asked to list, um, say, 10 people that you're looking forward to meeting and having coffee with in heaven, I'm sure hoping that there's coffee in heaven. <laughs> I can't wait to drink a cup of coffee after 5 o'clock. It is going to be a great day. But who, who would be on your list? Who would be on your list? I would love to have coffee. One of those individuals that I'm going to have coffee with is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Man, I'm going to have so many questions. What was it like? Can you even imagine? What would it be like to have Jesus, the Christ, living under your roof? I would have all these questions. What was he like? Did you like him? I mean, was he... So perfect, I mean, that you guys, it, it, he irritated. What was he like <laughs> to have Jesus living in your home? Well, James, I love James. And James uh, is only mentioned a few times in the Bible. But he authored one of the most important letters in all of the scriptures. And if you're not in a Bible study right now, um, I would recommend that you grab the book of James and read it and even take notes. There's so much in it. Yeah. Now, he becomes, are you ready for this? He becomes, James becomes the leader of the church. The leader of the church. Now, you would think it would be Peter. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. You might think it would be Paul. But it's neither of them. It's James. Peter, as well as Paul. Peter, the apostle to the Jews, and you have Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. They willingly submit themselves. They come under the authority of this man, James. How come? How come? What was it about James that instilled in them such confidence? That they were willing to come under him, submit to him, submit to his leadership. Well, what I want you to notice is what James doesn't do. When he introduces himself in this wonderful letter, what he doesn't do is he doesn't say, James the brother of Jesus. Yeah. That, that, that's what causes me to have this authority. No, he doesn't say that. Nor does he say that he is the head of the church, which he is, the apostle of the church, of the living Christ. He doesn't say that. He could have said that. He could have said either of those things. But he doesn't. He opens up his letter by saying James and many versions, chapter uh, one, verse one, many, many of the versions say servant. But that's just kind of not really what or how we should see him. In fact, the word he uses is doulos in the Greek. It's the word slave. Slave. A slave of Jesus, of God, and the Lord. 
which becomes an important theme in this teaching. Lord. Lord. He's the Lord of my life, he would say. He's the overseer of my life. He's the ruler of my life. He's the Lord of my life. The Lord. And then he adds Jesus Christ. A servant of God and Jesus. He feels no need to identify himself other than this. Not the brother of Jesus, nor in charge of the church. His authority in the church comes from the fact that he knows Jesus as Lord. As Lord of his life. See, this is what mattered to him. It didn't matter to him that he was the half-brother. It didn't matter to him that he had this high position in the church. What matters to him, in fact, to Peter, Peter submits to this man's leadership because James had submitted himself under the authority of Jesus. That's what Lord means. The writer to the, to the Romans, Paul, says that we are to confess Jesus as Savior. No, as Lord. As Lord. Lord means I have submitted myself to Him. So the question is this. You can believe in Jesus, but the question is, have you done that? Have you come under His authority? His family connection to Jesus wasn't what Peter admired. It wasn't the fact that he had come what... that what was important to him is that he had come to believe that his older sibling brother was in fact the Christ. And submitting to him as such was what he had come to do and his authority in the church was grounded not in his education. He's obviously an educated man because he writes so well. It wasn't his education, not his pedigree, not his titles, not his power, not his position, not his reputation. No, but his willingness to come under the authority of Jesus Christ is what makes him into the leader that he was. That's what does it. The same can be said for any of us who serve as leaders or elders, Charlie, in the church. It's not our titles. That's not what's important. Everyone who serves as a leader, the ministry, the women's ministry, whatever it is, what is admirable about a leader is not their position, it's not their title, but it's their relationship to Christ. Amen? That has to be there. Relationship to Jesus as our Lord. And so he says about himself in verse 1, James verse 1, We'll put that up here. James, a servant of God or a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the diaspora, that is, the Christians were suffering. They were living all over the place. Then he says this in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, my sisters, when you encounter various trials in your life. Now first, he was a slave. He sees himself as a slave. He acts as a slave. Being a slave to someone is a position that they held in the household. In the household, you are a slave. And this position required complete, total obedience. Not half-heartedly, but totally obedient to Christ. That's what they saw in James. It wasn't his title. It was his heart. Complete obedience. Humility with unshakable loyalty. And for James, being this person for Jesus was the highest honor that he could pay to Christ. And Peter, as, the, as well as Paul and the others who lived in Jerusalem, recognized this about him. 
The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Greatness does not, does not come from your position. It comes from your submission. And that's who he is. Peter comes under the authority in the church, under his authority, because James had submitted his life under the authority of Jesus. I'm sharing this with you to give you kind of a, a backstory be, because he's going to say some really important things in the first four verses. He was writing to believers who were going through a tough time. And maybe you are today. If you're not today, you will in the future. And these believers were going through a hardship. And they were even, some were even persecuted. They had been uprooted from their homes. They had lost everything. They were living all over the Roman Empire. It was tough, tough times. And maybe that's you. And his goal is to encourage them in whatever difficulty they find themselves. He wants to encourage them. He wants to teach them something very important about those times in which we all go through. If he wrote the book of Hebrews, now the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. It, I kind of think maybe it was him. Maybe. Who knows? But in Hebrews 10, 24, the author says this, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. This is what James is doing. He's stirring us up, trying to motivate us to do something when tough times come. And in verse two, 1 and 2, Count it all joy, my brethren, my sisterin, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfastness. Endurance. He's saying when you're facing life's hard times, difficulties. He's saying the oddest thing. He's saying, meet them head on, but with joy. With joy. And he's going to tell us why. Now, wouldn't, be, wouldn't joy be the last emotion you'd experience when you go through a hard time? When life isn't good? See, he wants us to respond unnaturally, not naturally, unnaturally. This is an unnatural response to a terribly hard thing in your life. It's unnatural, but he wants us to do that because there's an outcome from it. And he's going to tell us what it is. The natural response, you're going through a hard time, cancer, maybe heart problems, maybe financial problems, maybe kid problems, grandchildren problems, whatever it is, it's a tough time. When life isn't good, our natural response to that time is to really see it as bad, as a terrible thing that we're going through. Instead, James says, see it unnaturally not naturally see it unnaturally because what he's doing what God is doing through it is far more than you can imagine he wants us to ask ourselves the question who do we belong to who's are we? He knows who he belongs to. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, in other words, Jesus is in control. How often do we feel like we're going through a hard time? We feel like, who's in control? He wants us to realize he is. That's what Lord means. He's the owner of the household. I work for him. He's in charge. It's his household. I'm the slave. I'm obedient. I follow him, but he's in charge. It's his household. And he wants us to ask the question, who do you belong to? Is he Lord? 
Do you see him as such or not? Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Is the trial, the difficulty, the tragedy, the diagnosis, is that what is in charge of your life? Because if it's in charge of your life, your response to that is going to be very, very different if you come to realize who else can be in charge of your life. If we don't ask ourselves the question, to whom do I belong, we're going to get angry. We are. We're going to be upset. We're going to fail to appropriate our faith. Our faith is going to be replaced by fear. Our emotional response will be to blame someone and where is God in all of this? We get, we're going to get sad and mad. See, life isn't always a peach cobbler. It just isn't. Sometimes it's just the pits. And James is saying, there is a healthier alternative to the natural response to difficulties. Much healthier. The unnatural response. When we're going through hard times, and man, I've gone through them, you've gone through them. We went through it last year. Hard times, and you went through it with us. And we're going through it with some of you now. But we went through it, and we experienced joy instead of all the rest. There is joy in knowing that regardless of what we're going through, the outcome of it, and listen, the outcome of it, and it will end, will, it will, when it's all over and it's going to be over, the outcome of it, James is saying that you're going to go through it, but the outcome of it will be good. It will be. In fact, he says it's going to be very, 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 very good. Gooder. Yeah. And he's saying if you will choose joy, that is if you will choose to see Jesus as Lord of your life, that he's in charge of what's going on, right? Because you belong to him. There are no accidents when it comes to God. But if you will choose joy rather than anger, you will end up better off. You're going to end up better off than before you went through it. You will. And this is not about being happy. I mean, come on. Who wants... This? We, we don't say, oh, happy day, I have cancer. And that's silly. It's stupid. He's not suggesting, don't worry, be happy. Rejoicing in a hard time is a belief that Jesus is in charge. That Jesus is Lord of my life. That's why James says this. He says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord because he's my Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the hard times end, and it will end, it will either end and you're in heaven, and what could be better than that? Or it will end in this life. You will go through it better off than before you went through it. The end will justify the means. The end will. It will. Joy is an attitude. It's an attitude of the heart. It's experiencing a good attitude. It's not an emotion. It's an attitude that we can have a confidence in our hearts that when we go through rough patches, and we all do and we all will, we believe that God is in control and no matter what I'm experiencing, He's got this. He's got my back. And we'll know, we will know that Romans 8.28 is true, that all things do in fact work together for the good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. They just do. Our joy, this attitude, is a response of our faith in God that we trust. Trust totally and completely. And then in verse 3, 
He says, for you know, or you should know, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or endurance. Endurance. I like that word better. Endurance. When someone is preparing for a marathon, and I don't know why anybody would, really, come on. Um, what they do is, uh, my son-in-law is one of these Spartan athletes. He's a Spartan athlete back, crazy, crazy people. They, they do all these long runs, like, how many miles? I mean, come on. Some of them are like 30-mile runs, aren't they? Or 20-mile runs and 1,000-mile runs. I don't know. I mean, they're insane. Pray for them. So, when someone, what are they talking about? Marathons. When someone is preparing for a marathon, you just say, I'm going to run a marathon, but you've only run three miles. But you get it in your head, you're going to run a marathon. What you do next is, you'll run five miles. Because you're testing yourself. You run five miles, you go, ah, I'm okay with this. Then you decide a couple days later, I'm going to run seven miles. And you run and you do it. You run those seven miles. And then... A, a couple days later, you run nine miles until you've gotten up to about 18 miles. You run, you've run 18 miles, and it's taken you three months to get there, but you have worked on it, and you're now at 18 miles, and you know that because I've started with this five, and I'm now at 18, I can do this. What do you have? Endurance, right? What endurance is, it prepares you for what's coming before you. For that long marathon, what is it, 26 miles? 26.4 miles? I, I would do the point four. Any day, I'll do the point four. I might have to walk part of it. What James is saying is, what we as believers go through gives us the opportunity to increase our endurance. That's what God is doing. Because God knows you're going to need more endurance later on. And as you grow older, you're going to need it. Or some tragedy happens in your family. Or some event happens. Uh, some wipes you out this way or that way. God knows that you're going to need endurance to handle it. That's why He tests you. Puts you through it. In fact, he says, going through the hard time will produce much more, more in you. More, more, and more. Endurance. The testing of our faith is always positive. That's how we're to see it. That's why he says, consider it all joy. Rejoice in it because it's always positive, even though it's hard. It's not, it's not easy to run 10 miles or 15 miles or 18 miles or 26 miles. It's not easy. Not going to be easy. We need more endurance. Do you know that a diamond was once a piece of coal? So I gave Candy a piece of coal and I said, one day this is, this is going to become a diamond. No. No. And the interesting thing about coal is it's so soft. It's just soft. But that diamond started out as a piece of coal. And, but because of the intense pressure on that, that stress on that coal over the years, that piece of coal, that soft piece of coal becomes one of the hardest minerals on planet Earth. See, that's what God does. You start your journey with Christ like a piece of coal. Your faith's weak. It's soft. And God knows that you're going to need strong faith as you live your life. You're going to need endurance. And so what He does is He puts us into the situation of intense pressure. I have been through them our entire ministry. We've seen these tough Tough, tough times. I like what Pastor Andy Woods said. He is, he's the pastor that replaced Rick Warren. He's a young guy. He's super intelligent. He's just right, spot on. He said this, A faith that has been tested is a faith 
it's brilliant. They can be trusted. Amen? The testing of our faith, it does this. It produces endurance. It's interesting that the, the root word for endurance in Latin means to harden. Just like a diamond. It's one of the reasons Peter admired James. It's one of the reasons he was willing to submit to the authority of that man. Because he saw in him that the testing of his faith, and you know James was tested a lot. I mean, can you imagine, we can, we can laugh about this, but can you imagine living in the same household with Jesus? It wouldn't be easy. It wouldn't be. At all. He had the, his faith was tested a whole lot. And, and these apostles saw in him a solid rock faith that they admired. And they were willing to submit to. See, I want that in my own life. I want you to see that in my life. I want to see it in your life. I want to see this happening in your life. Because that's certainly a reason to rejoice. And then he says, verse 4, Let this endurance have its full effect, that you may be perfect, three things, perfect, complete, lacking, and nothing. Perfect. The Bible says we're to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We're, the goal is perfection. We're to be perfect. How many of us are perfect? Only one. Jesus. Everybody else? No. The word perfect is interesting because it doesn't, in the Bible, doesn't have the connotation that we're thinking. Because none of us are going to be perfect. But the verse says that we're to be perfect in this sense. The word perfect means without weak spots, weaknesses. We all have them, right? How do you get rid of the weaknesses in your life? The weak areas in your life. How do you get rid of that? I had a friend that he was rough. Rough. Wasn't nice. How do you get rid of that? Out of his life. He just had this personality. He's a very successful businessman, but he was, he was hard. But God put him through a trial. And when that trial ended, that person became nice, kind. I'd pick him up and take him for drives. And he was a different man. See, he had these weaknesses in his life. He couldn't get rid of those weaknesses. And the only way he could get rid of those weaknesses is for God to do it in his life. That's what perfect Perfect means. You're not going to believe this, but this is absolutely the case. I used to have panic attacks. And they were terrible. Anybody? Yeah? Okay. I used to have these terrible panic attacks. And in fact, I would, you know, the number one fear people have, you know what the number one fear is? Speaking in public, right? Being called upon. That's the number one fear people have. I would, I would, when I was in my 19, 20 years old, and I would be asked to speak or to stand up, and my heart would race. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, my heart would race so fast. I felt it was going to jump out of my chest. I, I would lose my train of thought. I, um, I, I couldn't catch my breath. Couldn't, <laughs> it was terrible. I had no confidence in my ability to speak. And what's ironic is some preacher, old preacher, pointing to me said, and we were, when I was in college and had become a Christian then, he pointed to me and said, that boy, he did this three times, that boy is going to become a preacher. And I, you know what? I chuckled inside. I felt like Sarah, Abraham's, you know, wife, when she's just this old, old, old woman, and the angel said, you're going to have a baby. And she laughed. Well, that's what I did. Inside, you don't there's no way under the sun I'm ever going to be a public speaker. But you know what God did? He put me in the leadership when I was in college. I helped to start this 
Christian ministry. Put me right into leadership. And guess what leaders have to do? They have to speak in public. And we had to do teaching. And I had to stand up. And I was scared to death. And I will confess to you that when I started, I was horrible. Horrible, horrible. I'd lose my breath. And God kept doing that. He kept putting me in front of people. And I would speak. And in fact, I spoke at a high school in Marion, North Carolina. And scared to death. But he kept giving me these opportunities. And I felt like, I, God, I can't let you down. I've got to say yes to these opportunities. And he tested me. He put me into these difficult situation Because what he was doing is... He was perfecting me. He was getting rid of the weakness in my life. And I've been doing this for 46 years. All because of him. If that hadn't happened, I would never, ever be a preacher. Never, ever. President, yeah. But not a preacher. No. Okay. All right. So that's what, he, that's what happens. And so he tells us that we would be perfect. And then he says, complete. Hey, this is the, the, the other part of this. It's like he adds things to your life. He gets rid of stuff, but he starts adding things to your life, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. He prepares you for whatever life throws at you. Here I am. I'm a young pastor. I was probably about 30, 31 years old. And in the morning, the, rescue, the head of the rescue squad comes to my door, knocks on my door, and he says, Pastor, can you come out? I need to tell you something. And this is what he said. He said, last night, the car, a car flipped over. Four of the kids in the car drowned. One of the kids in the car that drowned. Remember your church? They, uh, you got come with me. You have to tell mom and dad that their daughter drowned. And this daughter was a single mom. She had about a one-year-old little baby. And she drowned. Black ice, went off the road, car flipped, and she died, right? Well, I want to tell you, I want to give testimony about that family that after hearing the worst news anybody could ever hear, it did not destroy their faith they were strong in the Lord and the power of His might. I watched it because they were part of my church. And I watched them. How are they going to go through this? What's going to happen to their faith? They were strong, stronger as a result of this. Because their faith, they were complete, lacking in nothing. All right, I'm, I'm almost done. This is all I have left. Okay. Oh, oh, I forgot about this. No. All of us here want to finish well. Amen? Yes? When we stand in the presence of our Lord, and we will, we want to hear from Jesus two words. Well done. Well done. Guess what? So does he. Yeah. As a father, I want my children to succeed. I really do. I really want them to do well. Be successful in every area of their life. So does he. When you stand before him, he wants to say to you, well done. But in order for that to happen, he's got to help you. He's got to help me. Psalm 11 verse 5 says, The Lord tests the righteous. He does. To bring into our lives what would otherwise be lacking. That's why He does it. A faith that is tested is a faith that can be trusted. He's going to test your faith. So He says, Consider it all joy when you're going through it, because it's how I am building into your life all that is needed in your life to live well and to end well. He is. Let's take it to heart. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and 
We thank you for this um, teaching, and we thank you that um, it is unnatural. It's not natural for anyone to go through life's difficulties, and to consider it all joy just seems so outlandish, but it's for us to realize that through the processes you build into us perfection, completion, where we lack nothing in our lives to accomplish that for which you have called us to do. And it's through the testing of our faith that we become strong, much stronger, and we're grateful for it. The Bible says, give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So we can say, we're thankful for the hard times. And we need to be thankful for them because it is through them that you do the most extraordinary things. In Jesus' name, amen.